Hate crimes on the rise in Toronto. Woman dies at the Abbotsford Regional Hospital after waiting 14 hours in the ER. Canada is spending more than $2 billion to buy itself a fleet of weapons laden flying robots. Sudan kicks Chadian diplomats out, arguing that Chad is helping the rapid support forces. And 14,000 UN peacekeepers are set to leave another failed mission, this time in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Good morning. It's Wednesday, December 20th. I'm Nora. Here are your headlines. This morning, we start with hate crime data that is new coming from Toronto Police. And remember, hate crime data is always fraught. It only reflects what people report. Many hate crimes are so mundane and normal that people just don't report them. Like, how do you report your racist boss or a racist interaction that you've had in a coffee shop? Mostly people don't. So with that being said, the lead from a piece written by Andy Tagaki in the Toronto Star reads this, quote, hate crimes targeting Jewish Canadians, as well as Palestinian, Muslim and Arab Canadians made up all but two hate crimes in the city reported to Toronto police since October 7th, according to new statistics, unquote. It's interesting that Tagaki wrote it in that way, saying, quote, targeting Jewish Canadians as well as Palestinian, Muslim and Arab, unquote. Why was it written that way when the increase in Islamophobic hate crimes was 900 percent, while the increase of anti-Semitic hate crimes was 200 percent? Shouldn't the larger number here lead? Why did he just tack on as well as Palestinian, Muslim and Arab Canadians? Anyway, regardless, combined, the number of hate crimes reported per day went from 0.9 to 1.4. Hate crimes targeting queer people also increased by 35.5% over numbers from last year. Toronto police have charged 16 people in assault-related hate crimes, though Tagaki didn't break out those in terms of which communities they targeted. The police also specifically noted graffiti. There was 111 instances of anti-Semitic graffiti and 27 instances of Islamophobic graffiti that have been reported since October 7th. See what I did there? I led with the highest, went to the lowest, as we're supposed to do in journalism. Overall, hate crimes increased by 41%. Next, another person has died while waiting too long in a hospital emergency room. Luanora Ertenkoff was just 45 years old. She died at the Abbotsford Regional Hospital after having waited 14 hours to be cared for. And yes, Abbotsford was also on the Daily News podcast yesterday, so rare shout out to that town, twice in a row. Global News reporters Ashley Judd and Angela Jung report that Ertkenkoff had a disorder that caused her body to regularly produce kidney stones. She was used to the symptoms and treatment, her family said. On December 13th, Ertkenkoff started feeling unwell. She had an infection and she was able to get antibiotic treatment right away from her doctor. But by December 15th, the antibiotics weren't working, so her daughter took her to eMERGE. Despite the fact that her daughter says that it was clear in Ertkenkoff's charts that if she wasn't treated quickly, it would become life-threatening, they told her to wait. Her daughter kept asking how long it would be to see the doctor, and nurses kept saying that in the Abbotsford Regional Hospital, like everywhere else, it's priority-based. It took 12 hours to finally be admitted, and then they waited even longer to actually see a doctor. Finally, eventually, she was given an IV with antibiotics and painkillers. So her daughter left to go home and sleep for a bit, thinking that her mother was finally stable. The next day, Ertkenkoff died from multiple organ failure. Her daughter, Hannah Rofi, said this, quote, I'm speaking out because my family currently is not whole. She's missing, and I'm hoping that maybe I will keep somebody else's family whole so that this doesn't happen to someone else's friend or relative or mother. I want them to be held accountable. I don't want them to treat it like just another day in the office, you know, and then they get to leave and go home and spend their holidays with their families and New Year's, and we don't. I think it should be fair on both ends. I think they should answer for what they did. I think they owe us that much. Unquote. Now, the article ends there, but I'll remind you that this was the hospital where police shot and killed someone in the emergency waiting room not too long ago. And three weeks ago, conservative MLA Bruce Bandman, who had been in that same hospital with his daughter, 
spoke out saying he was horrified by the conditions that he saw while waiting with his daughter in that hospital. Of course, he had to be racist about his horror, calling it, quote, something you might find in a third world country, unquote, but then described what he saw. Patients lined up down the hallway in beds, a soiled diaper and feces all over the ER bathroom, the only bathroom that everyone had to use. And another person also complained about the state of the emergency room, specifically mentioning stained bedding and also the feces on the floor. That person said that these things were not cleaned up for two days. And one month ago, an 85-year-old woman who had an infection spent five days in the hallway of the hospital. It seems like the provincial government there has a bit of a crisis on its hands. Someone remind me, which, which party there is in power? In related news, related in that these crises are not inevitable, but the results of politicians making bad decisions, the Canadian Air Force is going to be able to get armed drones. Murray Brewster with the CBC qualifies this news as saying, finally, quote unquote, finally, as if it's been like unacceptable that we haven't had armed drones all this time. It is a program that governments from Trudeau back to Harper have been trying to develop. And finally, I guess, we got them. Yay, armed drones. Mm, woo. Bill Blair announced the decision, the same Bill Blair that spent a billion dollars on policing the G20 in Toronto against its own citizens. They are purchasing 11 MQ-9 Reaper drones that will cost $2.49 billion. The drones will be built by the U.S. company General Atomics. One of the delays was due to questions raised about whether or not these weapons could quote-unquote perform in the Arctic. Oh my God, guys, perform. Mm -hmm. Okay. They will have to be modified for Arctic conditions and will be changed to add surveillance equipment made right here in Canada. Hangars will be needed to be built as well, of course, to house the drones, and they will be housed at military air bases in Greenwood, Nova Scotia, and Comox, BC. They will be operated out of Ottawa, and so the virtual cockpit will be built there. Man, it's beautiful to see nation building in the year of our Lord 2023. Remote weapons located from sea to sea and operated from Ottawa. The government claims that there will be 700 jobs made as a result of this, which they don't explain how, considering the drones are being built in the United States. Uh, and it's a ridiculous piece of propaganda to include in the article because, you know, uh, first of all, there's no guarantee that that's going to happen. And second of all, you know, just open a Revenue Canada office and hire a thousand new workers to staff it. There, I just got you 300 new jobs on top of those 700 jobs without needing to buy a flying fleet of murder robots. Of course, the article doesn't really explain why we need this other than for defense and surveillance and all these kinds of buzzwords. But, uh, you know, I guess Canada's gearing up for war of some kind, which makes me feel great. Does it make you feel great? Mm. Next, international news. And we start from news from the Sudan Tribune first. The Sudanese Minister of Finance, Jibril Ibrahim, has called for the country to sever diplomatic ties with Chad. Chad, of course, borders Sudan. And at the border of Chad is where the rapid support forces are the strongest. The Sudanese government is alleging that Chad and the United Arab Emirates are interfering in Sudan's internal affairs. Three Chadian diplomats were ordered to leave Sudan as well this week. Sudan accuses Chad and the Emirates of helping the rapid support forces, something that Chad denies. President Mohamed Idris Deby has been working with the UAE as that country has promised to secure France's support for Deby's presidency after Chad goes through a difficult political moment. They are currently waiting on the results of a vote on a new constitution for Chad. The results have not yet been released. Last Friday, the United States' National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan met with Taunoon bin Zayed, the UAE's National Security Advisor, and the two discussed de-escalating the war between the RSF and the Sudanese army. And finally, man, it's pretty clear that the United Nations is amidst a crisis of legitimacy. Its inability to do anything in Gaza is probably the biggest example, but it's also being booted from longstanding missions like in Mali. Well, the UN Security Council has agreed to withdraw UN peacekeepers earlier than expected from the Democratic Republic of Congo. There are 14,000 UN peacekeepers in the DRC. The decision was made unanimously. 
Congolese authorities have been critical of the UN intervention for a long time, arguing that it isn't actually protecting civilians from armed groups. Groups like the Allied Democratic Forces and M23 are terrorizing civilians in North Kivu, South Kivu, and Ituri provinces, all in the eastern part of the country. This week, the DRC has presidential and parliamentary elections. Al Jazeera says that insecurity and poverty will be key issues for voters. There has only been one peaceful transition of power in 63 years in the DRC. President Felix Tshisekedi is running again. He last ran in December 2018 in an election where there were claims of voter irregularities. And so people are watching this week's elections very, very closely. Those are your headlines for Wednesday, December 20th. I'm Nora. You are listening to this podcast at sandyandnora.com on the Real News Network podcast feed and anywhere you get your podcasts. I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday. It's uh, already December 20th. So, you know, it's getting to be the shortest days of the year. I kind of like when we get to the shortest days of the year. And you know what? The sun's coming back very soon. So hang on tight and I'll talk to you tomorrow.